Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lilia Kudelia, and I'm the guest curator at Residency Unlimited. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's inaugural program. Uh, Meets and Bounds is a new series of monthly conversations with the laureates of the Young Visual Artists Awards program, YVAA. YVAA is a network of 12 national awards that provide young artists from Eastern, Central and Southern Europe with a two months residency in New York, hosted by Residency Unlimited. The program takes place on an annual basis since 2015 and is supported by the Trust for Mutual Understanding. In this series of talks, uh, artists from the region will speak about globally resonant issues while sharing with us a focused perspective on its relevant aspects in their home countries. The title for the program, Meets and Bounds, comes from a term used in cartography and the real estate, and it refers to the method of surveying land that has been used for many centuries for the definition of general boundaries. Um, the idea behind these conversations is to outline uh, the contact zones and to understand the reasons that often pull these regions apart and enable the formation of borders, whether it's mental, economical, infrastructural, or else. And today we're talking about industrial heritage and post-industrial landscapes. Uh, before diving in, I would like to thank again the team of Residency Unlimited for helping to organize the event and the Trust for Mutual Understanding for their support and making this wonderful artist exchange program possible. It is my pleasure now to introduce today's panelists. Uh, Lori Laco, whose video you just watched um, at the beginning, is from Albania and she's the winner of the 2020 RG Award. She got master's degree in visual arts and new expressive styles and the BFA in painting from the Academy of Fine Arts in Florence, Italy, where she currently primarily lives and works. Lori also studied at Academy der Bilden und Kunste in Munich. Her solo exhibitions were presented at Museo Novecento in Florence in Italy and at Civic Gallery in Squadra in Albania. Her work has been also featured in group shows at Zeta Contemporary Art Center in Tirana, Villa Reale in Monza, Italy, um, places in Geneva, Italy, and um, also she participated at art residencies in Graz, Austria, at Fondazione Pistoletto in Italy, um, Abazia di Mirasole and Casa de Story in Milan, Art House in Squadra, Albania, and Infrared Artist Residency in Pristina. Kosovo. Sommer Spat is from Kosovo and he's the winner of the 2019 Artists of Tomorrow Award. Sommer's practice is rooted in archival research and comprises video, photography, and installation. His projects deal with the various forms and representations of state violence, both on the local and on international level. Uh, Sommer studied photography at Mimar Sinan Fine Arts University in Istanbul in Turkey and at the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg in Germany. His works were presented in many group exhibitions in Turkey and Kosovo, including the Autostrada Biennale in 2019 in prison, where he currently lives and works. And uh, today we also have Lana Stoichevich with us, who won Radoslav Puder Award just a few months ago in 2021. Um, Lana graduated with a degree in painting from the Academy of Arts in Split, where she currently teaches at the Visual Culture and Fine Arts Department. Her work was on view at Australia Biennale in Dresden, Museum of Modern Art in Dubrovnik, Museum of Fine Arts in Split, Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb, New East Photo Prize at Culvert Foundation in London, Photon Gallery in Ljubljana, the Window Gallery in Paris, and many more. Um, she also won the third prize of Ivan Kozaric Award earlier this year. So some final housekeeping notes uh, before we start the conversation. I would like to encourage you to drop your questions in the chat uh, window below, and we can address them later during the session. Um, um, when I was preparing for um, today's talk, um, I came across the term moral landscapes, which relates to representations that capture like, unresolved political, social, and cultural tensions that are connected to deindustrialization across the world. Um, and um, I was fascinated that the work of um, Lana, Sommer, and Lori engages with these kinds of representations directly. So that's why I invited them to be on the panel today. 
and thank you so much for agreeing to, to speak with us. Um, whether this is a former electrode and ferro alloy factory or a limestone production facility or a railroad systems, um, the works that these artists create in photographs, videos, and installations uh, respond to the conditions of the present and filter the memory of the industrial past. Um, the idea that the landscape um, demands certain moral judgment from people who inhabit it is very appealing to me. And I wanted to start uh, by asking you um, what is inscribed on the landscapes that surrounded you when you grew up. Um, and also to be more precise, I wonder if you could talk, um, um, when did you start noticing and became aware that um, these uh, territories or the sites that you look at regularly have their own voice and that engages you in a conversation. Um, maybe we can start, maybe Sommer, you can start telling us a little bit about your environment first. Uh, I was born in 96, so uh, when I was, I was growing, it was like after the war, 2000s, and I don't have any idea about uh, industrial past, of course, so because there was nothing, <laughs> like you know, many empty rim buildings that uh, I had no idea about them. And uh, it was just <laughs> a very slow process. Uh, mm -hmm. I just started to hear about like some names, names of the factories, but I also started to uh, learn which one is which factory and stuff. But, but like the real interest started maybe some, maybe four, five, five years ago. But I started this railway project that, that is called We Build Railways, Railways Built Us in 2016. But uh, it also had a, a, a different point when I started. But uh, while the archival, uh, when I went into the archives, when I start to find how uh, this railway line was um, constructed, it totally changed uh, how I saw it because uh, okay we said the voice I mean you said the voice of the uh, of the territories or or buildings the industrial zones the industrial heritage um, I can say that industrial heritage doesn't exist in Kosovo right now uh, because there was a very I can call crazy, <laughs> really crazy privatization process after the after the two thousand and uh, all the factories, all the all this kind of places that had many workers uh, became like shopping malls or uh, very. <laughs> uh, very shameful resident, residential buildings and stuff. Okay, there are some, uh, there are still some places that still exist. I mean, uh, some buildings of the factories or uh, this railway station in my city in prison, but it's in a, in a ruined situation. So uh, that, that voice is like a sadly screaming voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, this, this landscapes, uh, this landscape, this landscapes uh, had changed a lot in oh, many, many years. I realized it now. I mean, I was grown in. I just saw how uh, from the ruin, how they were converted to something else. But uh, going into the archives, finding the pictures, because I work mostly with archives. I like uh, make research about, uh, I can say, a socialist era of mm -hmm. Moscow and Yugoslavia. I mostly uh, also like cooperatives, 
how all the factories started after the Second World War, uh, voluntary uh, youth labor actions and stuff. That's what, uh, and yeah. But you grew up in uh, you grew up in um, in the capital uh, of the country, or no, no. I can say uh, second largest city. I'm still mm -hmm. in Prizren. Mm -hmm. Prizren. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lana, how do you feel about um, preservation of historical buildings and interest in industrial infrastructures in Croatia? Um, I think that uh, first, hello everyone, and thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank the Residency Unlimited uh, for organizing this event and uh, Lilia for choosing such an interesting topic. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, industrial uh, heritage in Croatia is still not uh, perceived as heritage mm -hmm. <laughs> as it should be. So a lot of uh, uh, important artifacts uh, from uh, history of industry and uh, of, of course the buildings were completely demolished and uh, uh, that's something that really makes me sad. Uh, so, but I wanted to uh, just uh, give a short context uh, about where I grew up. Uh, so I grew up in a small town, Shibenik. Uh, it is uh, located on the Adriatic coast and uh, it has a amazing uh, old uh, medieval center, but uh, it's a further development um, was started by a military zone said uh, huge, huge factories for, Factories are quite huge for that uh, for town that is small. For uh, so, uh, it my hometown was deeply influenced by industrialization and uh, of course uh, with the collapse of the industry. And I also grew up uh, near near the former uh, electrode at the ferro alloy factory. And uh, uh, after it, uh, I grew up there after the factory was shut down and a lot of uh, industrial waste uh, uh, was left behind. So the first time I perceived the local landscape as a art topic uh, was uh, uh, when I uh, realized that that industrial waste uh, possess, uh, poses uh, um, danger, probably danger to me and my family. So at the same, same time, I was uh, scared, but I was also uh, intrigued by huge heaps of uh, gray and uh, gray and uh, black uh, uh, waste uh, it's uh, called slag and uh, it really looks like uh, those heaps really look like a natural landscape uh, but it, uh, they also look uh, bizarre so it's kind of uh, artificial dangerous post-industrial landscape and uh, after that i realized a project uh, called uh, black hill and uh, the theme of that project is uh, that same uh, industrial waste uh, that was relocated uh, in a remote, completely remote village. Uh, and um, like the basic idea for this, uh, this project uh, uh, was, uh, the basic inspiration was a uh, relation between, uh, between that new landscape and uh, uh, people who live in that village. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that project, uh, the majority of my work uh, became uh, deeply uh, related to the local landscape, especially built one. And I would like to show you just a few images from uh, this project. Uh, so uh, this project was uh, realized at the photo series. Uh, so this is a Black Hill, uh, local people call it Black Hill. Uh, sorry. And uh, I also made I made a costume that is like interpretation of a folk costume and uh, combined with a protect, protective suit. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, uh, it has a, uh, a local embroidery uh, on itself uh, that uh, represents uh, protection and hope. So mm, the symbols, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's like a... Uh, that's like something like... A, just uh, something that symbolizes uh, protection, but uh, they cannot be protected from the lens from the industrial waste that is probably quite danger dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, you would like to hear from you about um, the landscape that surrounded uh, you and your childhood. Um, 
Um, yes, actually, um, I think that the most familiar uh, post-industrial landscape, um, it has been five kilometers from the city, uh, from my city, Pogradec, which is situated in the southeast part of, of Albania, southeastern part. Um, and it was a nickel and iron uh, mine, um, which had in front of it also um, a railway station, uh, which was always not functioning. Actually, the, the reason why the railway station was situated there is because the, the nickel and the iron would go to Elbasan, which is the, the biggest, let's say, industrial area in Albania. And where also my video, it's, it, there was this connection between my city, between, between these minerals coming from my city to the, the biggest industrial area, which is, which is called Metallurgiku and it's located in Elbasan. Um, I think I had always, uh, as a kid, you know, like a strange feeling with, this, uh, with these ruins. And I was always making a lot of questions, why it, why it is like this, how it used to be. And uh, otherwise, the, the um, um, destructed architecture was surrounded me, surrounding me also in the very near to the center of the city. And I also, it was also my first approach to video art with, with this video Octapodi, uh, in which I was fascinated by this, by this building that I was seeing only ruins, but in the other hand, uh, older people were painting other images to me uh, because of their memories of how they, they, they remember the place. So this place, Guri Kuch, was always this kind of uh, phantasmagoric landscape, let's say, uh, which always fascinated me. But I think when I started to approach art in a more active way, um, I wanted to start a conversation with these buildings. I think that the post-industrial landscape is always telling to us a lot of things, but we should also um, try to listen to them. And what is happening in Albania uh, very often is so somehow a kind of decoration or people who are painting the facades with colorful uh, paintings but that's not the way I think uh, I think uh, we should deal with this kind of, of, of uh, heritage. And this is the case also with Guri Kuj. Every time I pass from my city to Tirana, uh, it's on my way. And now it's full of colorful paintings, which actually don't talk anything to you. And this is so something that probably is a left over from the 2003rd, when the prime minister of Albania uh, decided to paint the, 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 um, uh, a lot of palace, pal uh, palaces, a lot of flats in Tirana, which were built during the, uh, the dictatorship. Um, and so, I don't know, there is a little bit this kind of very superficial way of seeing it. So we just put some painting, some colorful, beautiful images, and then we are talking with them. Uh, it's just like going there and not hearing what this post-industrial landscape has to say and to tell us. Mm -hmm. That's surprising. Um, it's interesting how you um, all somehow reference the observation of this landscape in movement, right, when you move. Um, and um, it makes sense now to go back again to Sommer's project about railways. Uh, because in the case of Kosovo, this infra the railroad as infrastructure is also very deeply connected with the change of political systems. Um, um, if you compare the two countries, the neighboring countries, Albania and Kosovo, for example, Albania's railroads were built in 1947, um, probably the shortest railway history in Europe compared to Kosovo, uh, which summer you can tell us much more about, right? How it went through the Ottoman times until today. Um, Actually, the uh, case of Albania is much different, like the reality of uh, the political system, industrialization uh, uh, way in Albania and Kosovo is uh, so different. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, is that the first uh, railway system uh, they constructed the first railway system in 47 uh, it's like after the second world war like first beginning of the uh, 
communist Albania time, uh, in Kosovo it was totally different. I mean, uh, I can say that I cannot talk that much about this uh, part of Albania. I never made that much research about uh, that, but uh, I can tell about, I mean, the case of the Kosovo that uh, like first railway system started in 1874. Uh, it was still like Ottoman Empire time. Uh, and there was a huge uh, railway construction, like uh, we still know it, it's like Orient Express uh, to connect the East and West somehow. And uh, this part, this small part uh, that is in Kosovo, this railway line uh, is directly uh, from Mitrovica uh, to Skopje and Selanik, Selanik place. Uh, to the Greece, and it was built because of, I can say, the colonization. <laughs> uh, it was directly from the mining, Trepcha mining area uh, in Mitrovica um, to the sea, to the port, to uh, the Ottoman Empire gave the uh, mine, I mean, mining area to the a British mining company, and it's it started like this. But after the Second World War, uh, when Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, I mean, the political situation or uh, the develop, developing of uh, the country in Yugoslavia uh, was a bit alternative. For that time, I can say it. I mean, it's it was there was lots of maybe experimentation mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that that era uh, gave the it was very important the industrialization and urbanism, and it was not based on uh, it was not based on. Uh, exploitation of workers uh, or uh, farmers like in uh, like our current situation it's it was not uh, like this I mean I work for the uh, my project uh, there is only one line now that is not functional in Kosovo it's like from my city from Prizren uh, to the city called Klina and it's only non non functional uh, system it's not functioning till the 99 from the 99 war like from the last war i can say and uh, um, that line was built by volunteer workers volunteer workers so that uh, constructed something for themselves uh, like uh, the the state try to try to make make a experimentation with youth labor actions uh, young people were going <laughs> like working working but uh, i can say working uh, for themselves it was kind of uh, i mean this was not like a volunteering uh, which is now i mean they tried something like collective working, uh, voluntary collective working. I mean, it's a different thing if it was successful or not, but uh, it was an interesting uh, ex experiment, I guess. Would you like to share some images of the work you produced and um, maybe the questions that you um, contemplated? while working on this installation. <clears throat> so this is my work that was exhibited in Station Plyby Boxit in Pristina and also in Museo Maxi uh, in Italy, Rome. Um, okay, now I'm gonna talk about my work, <laughs> not the real history of so uh, 
Oh, this is my work, and there are also. Uh, so these this, are photographs. Um... Uh, uh, this is like uh, the first day. This picture is from the first day that I decided to work on on this project. I was just passing from there. I was not living in prison at that time, and uh, I remember as a child, I was as a kid playing with my friends around there, and uh, it was very weird. Like all the uh, everything is there, but there is no train. <laughs> the station is in ruin, and I saw that uh, there are some constructions, like constructions, but has no meaning it's uh up in the like railway system and uh, i started to document it it was like an activist documentary project but then i started to research about this thing i talked with many people then uh, i started to check uh, the newspapers of the construction time uh, from 67, uh, 67 to 72, I checked almost all the news about this construction and uh, I wanted to see uh, uh, how people that live in that time, I mean, I wanted to see that this space, this landscape uh, from the eyes of uh, people that saw uh, this railway system functioning. And I realized that volunteer young workers built uh, this system. Uh, and it totally changed the, the way of my work and it became, I mean, I, I found like this kind of portraits of the workers on the newspaper. <laughs> like a very proud worker uh, building a railway line for himself and <laughs> for the country. Uh, and uh, this became kind of a backbone of my work. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go back to this, uh, I exhibited like pictures, like photographs from the archive, a three channel video but I created a dynamic that uh, you see only the past uh, when you enter to the exhibition space. But in the other part, uh, when you turn your back <laughs> to the workers, you only have uh, this uh, current, uh, current ruins. The vestiges of, yeah. Yeah. Of their dreams. Mm -hmm. I like how the space apparently has this choreography, like in a relatively small space, you can build those relationships, as you said, like turn your back to the worker, um, uh, looking backwards, looking forward. Um, um, uh, Lori, um, let me redirect the question to you, speaking of uh, gazes um, again, because um, you uh, worked recently with uh, uh, drone footage. Um, and um, I wonder if you can share with us some ideas about this particular gaze that is needed to be able to reflect on the current conditions of the, 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 the industrial sector is in, the, the decay, to, to reflect on the decay. What, what role does technological mediation do you think also is playing in the process of collective experiences and individual experiences uh, when we talk about this inherited industrial landscapes? Um, actually, before doing this work, mm -hmm. I never thought before to use a drone as a medium. Um, maybe as well because drone in Albania, when you think of drone filming, you think of the filmings of uh, the prime minister who wants to show Albania from up, so everything looks good from far away. Uh, that's so how I feel when I travel. I come by airplane in Albania from Italy and I see Albania from up and everything looks magnificent because we have a wonderful landscape, but that's not enough. So for me, it was a very conflictual choice somehow and very, I was, 
yeah, I was pretty um, putting it in discussion. But on the other hand, um, the thing is that that was the only way to prove that these stones are still there. Um, because actually I faced this landscape by chance um, where I was going to, uh, to Funaris Lake, lakes. Um, there are four lakes, which are 24 kilometers far away from Elbasan, uh, which is the main city. Um, and while going to these lakes, you have to cross this very surreal landscape. Um, and I stopped with my friends to also talk with the people and see what was going on because I didn't know before. Uh, then I researched and I saw that obviously there have been also uh, other people who noticed them because they are staying there for 30 years, uh, hanging in the air. But in the other hand, it's not as well such a, um, let's say famous or uh, imaginary uh, because when also the work was shown in Zeta Gallery, a lot of people were asking me, where is this place? And so I don't think that it has a lot of uh, attention in terms of uh, visibility but in the other hand it's it's there uh, and it's a very surreal uh, surreal landscape what and is the installation shot of um, of the work together This is the this is the the final uh, screen. I mean, this maybe explains why I wanted to to use the drone filming because I wanted to see these stones uh, from up um, and also to access this area, which is inaccessible otherwise. So um, I like to solve the idea of this perspective of a, of a bird's eye perspective or a bird's eye gaze, uh, seeing the things from up. Um, and that's an image from the installation. Um, I th the the video was was in a in a smaller scale, and in the other hand, you could see the this large printing in which I um, actually somehow was an attempt to meld together two stories. Let's say so. In one hand, you see the hanging cable car uh, from a picture that I took uh, in the site. Um, in the other hand, I uh, took a screenshot from a research that I did eventually um, in which, I mean, it was something that people anticipated me when I was talking with them because I was like, okay, now this doesn't work. Uh, what are, what do we use in Albania? I didn't have much information about, uh, about the production of, uh, of the lime. And they say that now we just burn basically car tires um, and then documenting myself on the on, on, on this topic, I, I found us all this footage, which for me was very significant because there was a man that was showing how now it's produced, produced the, the, the lime. Um, and I showed, I, I chose this specific screenshot because I liked also uh, the silhouette of this man and this pointing finger uh, which somehow gets out of the frame. So this, this guiltiness is left without, uh, without nobody to, to somehow to embody it. Um, and yeah, I liked to, you know, to, to create a, somehow a, an image that would put together the past and the present of, 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 the, of the production of, of lime in Albania nowadays. Great, thank you. And speaking of past and present and also architectural landscapes and scenographic illusions, I would like to um, go to you, Lana, and ask um, about this intrigue as you build it in your photographs. Um, I think that it is fair to say that your work redefines industrial heritage as a concept because you extend it into the realm of contemporary tourism. So contemporary tourism as an industry as well that relies on this like well-oiled well 
mechanism um, that replicates and reanimates cultural symbols, cultural uh, heritage, and quite often it takes on these forms of kitsch and very flashy luxury. Um, so I would like you to share with us um, the recent project and tell us who are Betonicus and Plasticus, the personages that you invented. Um, and what they signify, um, what sy symptoms of Croatia's current economy they signify. Well, just a short introduction. Uh, I wanted to say that after the collapse of uh, Yugoslavia and uh, the process of uh, privatization of public ownership, uh, space became uh, the most desirable commodity on the market. So everyone wanted its own space. Uh, so after the majority of the uh, factories were demolished, uh, all hopes were placed in uh, tourism and uh, huge modernist hotels uh, were, were kind of replaced by uh, private uh, houses uh, for tourist rent and uh, those houses were uh, usually legal, illegally built. Uh, and uh, of, uh, also those houses are uh, richly decorated uh, with uh, neo style elements. Uh, so uh, I also must say that I'm uh, that I live in Split, uh, and it is it is a town uh, which developed around the Roman palace uh, that was built for the one of the most famous uh, Roman emperors Diocletian to spend his pension there. Uh, so uh, during the centuries, so that palace became a base for new archi architectural layers. And the uh, project you mentioned uh, is called Betonicus, and uh, it is about the relation uh, between, between historical and contemporary architectural elements. And uh, the main inspiration for the project, uh, for the concept, uh, was the idea that uh, neo style elements uh, act uh, as their ancient originals, uh, as, as if they were roles in a theater play. Uh, so I, that's why I imagined the uh, uh, theater play kind of a, a neo tragedy. And I wrote a, a short text uh, from uh, that tragedy. I also made, uh, I designed costumes and I uh, also designed the scenography, uh, but just a scale model of scenography, not, not uh, large scale. Uh, so, um, Betonicus, uh, and I must say that beton is creation word for concrete and plasticus are uh, main characters. So, uh, but uh, I also must say that uh, betonic beat is like a, a fake Latin version of, uh, of the word uh, concrete. Uh, so betonicus and plasticus are uh, main characters of that uh, tragedy. And uh, betonicus is uh, imagined as a neo-Corinthian uh, concrete column that is located uh, in an illegally uh, built house for tourist rent. But uh, from the text, uh, you can find out that uh, he's going through some kind of identity crisis uh, because uh, uh, he wants to be uh, his own original. So he wants to be a marble column uh, that is placed in uh, uh, Diocletian's palace. Uh, and uh, Plasticus is a personification of uh, plastic doors, uh, which are uh, like visual, uh, they're like uh, symbols of the, the, the visually polluted uh, historical city centers. And uh, these characters are imagined as symbols of uh, negligence and greed uh, that, uh, for example, destroyed uh, the ancient Roman wall just to put an ice cream fridge there. And that really happened in Split. <laughs> so I uh, also want to share just a few images from this project. So this is like uh, Betonicus uh, and uh, his photograph on uh, Peristyle uh, on uh, the ancient square of the Roman palace. And uh, this is a scale model of scenography. And also uh, this is photographed on the ancient square of the Acritius Palace uh, because uh, that uh, square uh, each summer becomes a theater stage. And this is Plasticus, of course, like a plastic door. I love the sign um, that it holds. Yeah, it's like- <laughs> For the two-star uh, hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great. Can I ask you briefly about uh, the, the creative process and how you come across uh, information and materials uh, before you formulate the thesis of your work? Because we already discussed that it's obvious that the landscape impacts our moods and ideas. But when it comes to historical facts and ecological economy related records, statistical data, how do you proceed with your research and investigation? And I wonder if you ever collaborate with uh, people who have expertise in specific, in certain areas. Um, um, Lori, um, would you like to start? Um, yes, Talking I, about. yeah. 
as I mentioned so before, um, I've been very much interested about the way that these things impact the, the life of the people. So I don't I don't start from a database uh, research somehow. Uh, this kind of research comes eventually. Uh, but I'm very interested in the encounter somehow. So even in that case, I think that I was, I bumped into this. And yeah, I think that in my work, I'm, I'm more interested in what, uh, in what, in, in these encounters and, and in how the people perceive. So for me, it was so very important to talk with the people in that place, to know how much information they had, um, that somehow the, anthropological parts so to see how the people perceive perceive living in this with this landscape and so because of the danger of, of, of you know of these uh, containers hanging for 30 years in a surreal landscape um, and then eventually obviously I, I saw that um, we have terrible um, statistics on air pollution uh, and everything was somehow linked together. But the first uh, input was, was talking with people and encountering this, this landscape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Summer, what about you? Um, was it easy to find the photographs um, that ended up in the installation space? Um, I was working on researching something. I I feel like a detective. It's, mm -hmm. it's a process that uh, uh, I mean, it starts always with talking to people, talking to random people about a topic, then finding someone who has worked there, who worked there or who was engaged somehow there, asking if they have any documents, if they have any pictures, then uh, archives like uh, archive of possibility, archive of uh, that factory, archive of um, I mean the state archive, and all these archives are not well categorized. Uh, it's like I think uh, this probably not digitized in the most cases, right? Yeah, not actually not categorized at all, but. Uh, 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 in the same way, that's the exciting part uh, when you find something but you are interested for it, it totally uh, changes it. Okay, it has also the other part that people like other uh, oral history part, but uh, oral history part is all, always like question mark. You still uh, need some documents, you need some pictures. I mean the visual visual history uh, and this research process kind of um, creates the project because it starts with with an interest with a small interest and you just try to find more and more and more information and mm -hmm. you you became kind of a part of it I mean that story is still going on. And I feel like I'm a little uh, part of uh, of uh, that subject, kind of as a detective. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Lana, um, what about you? Um... Well, I, I usually start uh, with photo documentation of some specific site or phenomenon that I'm that I'm interested in. Uh, then I research, of course, literature, newspapers. Uh, internet resources and archives if the theme is related to the past. Uh, I also uh, usually contact some professionals or uh, I'm also interested to hear the stories of uh, people who are somehow personally uh, related to the topic I'm uh, researching. Uh, so after the research, I try to interpret uh, the most interesting information into concept. And uh, of course, I found the uh, pre precise information quite important while I'm, while I'm learning uh, uh, everything about some new topic. Uh, and uh, when I uh, try to uh, present my work to someone who's not familiar with that context, uh, but uh, I must admit that uh, 
uh, the statistical data and similar information are not too important for me in a second stage of the project. Uh, I, uh, I'm more interested in some um, uh, weird uh, or poetic uh, information or some metaphors, associations uh, that are like behind the facts. Uh, so uh, as an artist, I'm more interested uh, in an unstable uh, layers of the topic. Uh, I start with the uh, facts and then I try to uh, do something else with those facts. but. Uh, inspired by everything I, I came up uh, during the research. Mm -hmm, great. And speaking of inspirations, my next question to all of you was, if you had a chance to uh, travel to just one location in your co-panelists' home country, what place or what site would that be? Um, uh, Lana, would you like to share ideas for potential future travels and places that inspire you? Well, um, unfortunately, I've never visited Albania and Kosovo, although I would really love to because I'm really interested in the countries that share like similar histories uh, to Croatia. Uh, on, of course, on the tourist level, I would like to experience uh, culture and natural heritage, of course. But on a professional level, I would like to uh, explore some uh, bizarre situations in public space uh, similar uh, to the ones I research in in Croatia, uh, so I, I don't have one specific place, but I would like to research everything, explore everything. But uh, I'm especially interested, of course, in uh, famous Albanian bunkers, uh, especially the ones that are like intertwined with the uh, uh, contemporary architecture layers. And uh, I'm also intrigued by uh, contemporary art in Kosovo, which is from my perspective, like currently, I think in, in uh, Rise. Yeah, so okay. I don't have one specific location. I would like to see everything. Great. Laurie, what are your upcoming possible routes for travel and well, research? Choose both of them. <laughs> um, actually, um, I've been in both of the countries, but for somehow in Kosovo, uh, for an artistic residency, so it was more art uh, based um, uh, staying. And in, uh, in Croatia, I've been in Zagreb and Dubrovnik, but it was more a touristic way of, uh, of leaving the, the cities. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be interesting. We have a lot of things in common. So I think that is interesting also to think of, a, a, let's say, um, a more like to think so about the things that we have in common because I think that the politics are always trying to push us to see only what is different and to to to, to create this this idea of the other the otherness uh, but the matter of the fact is that that we have a lot of, of, of uh, histories and a lot of things in common so probably also yeah. to link uh, a link between between our stories yeah, the contact zones, which I was also thinking about at the beginning. Uh, some are um, curious about your um, ideas yeah, in this I, regard. I have never been in Croatia. I mean, I go to Albania very often. Uh, it's like border is like 20 minutes driving from my city. So uh, I also traveled Albania a lot. I mean, that's why. Uh, if I had something in my mind, probably I will do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will do it. And what I had, I already did. <laughs> I can say it. But uh, I would like to go to Croatia. And uh, actually, I'm more interested in talking to people. I would like to be in a small village, maybe near Rijeka, uh, in a kafana, drinking with uh, some old guys. and listening to their stories, take some advices, and actually asking to them, where should I go? <laughs> where should, which place should I uh, visit? Uh, because, of course, I also have some ideas about the, also the industry, industrial history of Croatia from some brands, you know, you know, uh, but I can say that I'm mostly interested in Rijeka. <laughs> uh, and the oral histories there. Mm -hmm. uh, not only the oral history, also it's a big port. Uh, uh, they were constructing like building uh, ships mm -hmm. in Rijeka, maybe uh, that part uh, 
also uh, also Rieka is known as a like antifa city <laughs> kind of <laughs> and, uh, the first punk gig punk concert was uh, in uh, east europe east europe was in Rieka. Uh, it was in 71 a band called Paraf. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, fascinating. I would like to encourage um, those of you who are listening to our conversation to drop your questions in uh, the chat. Um, and uh, if you have them, um, while we are waiting on your response, I have a final question to uh, Lana, Lori, and Sommer. Um, like the concluding. Um, remark uh, that's related to statistics. I asked uh, each of you to pick a statistical number that characterizes your country from the viewpoint relevant to our conversation today um, and um, to comment why this number seems important to you right now, why this particular angle. Um, Summer, would you like to go first and present us with your magic mystery? What is your mystery number? Uh the number actually when i think about it uh, i don't know what can i say about the uh, industrial growth rate or and uh, I'm, I'm not i don't know about this stuff that much but i only can talk about maybe like that di diaspora uh, mm -hmm. the diaspora, diaspora, yeah. diaspora of kosovo i mean uh, the diaspora of Kosovo is mostly in like, Switzerland and Germany, and they are very loyal to. I mean, the diaspora of Kosovo is very loyal to their country, and like GDP or the budget, yearly budget, um, like 60, 60 to seventy percent of the uh, budget of Kosovo is from Kosovo diaspora. And Kosovo has no uh, like real industry or uh, something else that earns. <laughs> um, the diaspora of Kosovo is like a, having a gas, like in the Middle East, or you just have like 70, 60% of your budget from uh, diaspora. It's because of like political history, for sure, people then migrate to other countries for no reason. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a totally different thing, you know, to, totally different subject. But uh, if we say like numbers, is the first thing that I can talk about. Yeah, I would have never guessed. Um, Lana, what about you? Um, uh, well, I already I already mentioned that I'm interested in the theme of illegal constru construction in Croatia, especially in Dalmatia, which is a re uh, region in, in which I live, and like a coastal region uh, by the Adriatic coast. And uh, of course, those houses were uh, uh, mostly um, built for uh, these are like private house private houses, but uh, like a hybrid of uh, uh, family house and a house for tourist rent. Uh, so. Uh, the interesting fact uh, is that uh, in 2011, the Croatian government uh, decided to start uh, the initiate to initiate the process of legalization legalization of illegally built houses, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, about uh, 900 900,000 applications were filed, and more than 95 percent uh, were uh, were resolved positively. That means that the building buildings that were built without permits and uh, without uh, obeying the law. Uh, became uh, legalized, just like, legal, just like that. Uh, so uh, you must know that Croatia has uh, approximate, approximately 4 million inhabitants. And from uh, this information, we can conclude that uh, it has at least 1 million illegally built buildings. Uh, and uh, there is also an uh, interesting fact that uh, the entirety of legalized square space is equal to the area of one and a half city of Zagreb, which is the Croatian capital. <laughs> so. Th these are like interesting informations, information for me. 
Yes, absolutely. The land of plasticuses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Betonicus. <laughs> Amazing. And Lori, um, tell us what number fascinated you when you were preparing for this conversation. Yeah, um, um, I was checking that the result of a report of 2020 published on the Institute for Habit and Development, co-planning, um, was stating that the level of air pollution in Tirana is above the norm set by the European Union, uh, twice higher. Um, and from a survey took in, in four big cities of Albania, like Tirana, Durus, Kodra, and Elbasan, the most problematic aspects were the urban air quality, um, as well the noise level, 26% higher than the, uh, the norm. Uh, which obviously increase the stress and the loss of focus uh, in, in our cities. Um, as well, we are, we are losing a lot of urban greenery. Um, as I was researching uh, in Tirana in the last 10 years, they have been lost 52.8 hectares of urban greenery. Um, and the, the level of air pollution is caused basically uh, because we still have a lot of uh, old cars. Uh, so the public and the private transportation is causing a lot of air pollution. And so this, the construction activity, which is uh, nowadays, I mean, now even when we are talking, everything is changing here and um, there is a lot of uh, informality and corruption with, uh, with the protection of the heritage and this um, construction activity, which is going wild. Wow. So here we end on this note about the quality of air and the quality of our architectural spaces around us and the very unexpected um, uh, cycles of economy. Um, um, we have um, a great question from the audience, from Olga Kometa, um, who said, thanks a lot for this illuminating discussion today. It was great to meet you all, all amazing artists, and learn more about the context of your works. I really enjoyed a chance to see some of your works today. And I have a question to all the artists. How do you see your works contributing to a greater good in your local communities and more broadly to the world art? Who would like to go first? Summer. Hey, well. <laughs> <laughs> How do I see my work contributing to well, I think uh, I'm not interested in that part, how my work uh, contributes to the world art. I'm more interested in part of uh, how my works, works are contributing to a greater good. I can say uh, I'm digging, trying to find interesting fragments or inspiring frag fragments from, uh, from the history that is still contemporary that still uh, that st still has uh, maybe more than from that that and that has uh, uh, how can I call it <laughs> I mean uh, yeah digging and uh, showing to the people uh, from uh, a different perspective. A different perspective, I can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, great. I definitely support you in the idea to strengthen the local community and to make an impact locally first before it, the work expands into a global realm. Um, Lori or Lana, would any of you like to continue? Yeah, Lana. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that all my works are. Uh, deeply related to local context. Uh, so I'm interested in topics that are somehow uh, important for the uh, local local people, but uh, uh, are also kind of neglected in uh, like a broader context. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, Ford mentioned the electro electrode and ferroalloy uh, factory. Uh, 
uh, after I did that uh, photographic project uh, about uh, uh, industrial waste that was relocated in a different uh, village, uh, I also made a project about uh, that's, that factory uh, in a way that I uh, published a newspaper uh, about that factory and the majority of the uh, content uh, was, uh, was uh, conversations with ex-workers, so with workers who were there. And uh, I was also inspired by the fact that uh, almost every factory in uh, Yugoslavia uh, in a certain period published its own newspapers and uh, newspaper. And I, uh, I distributed that newspaper for free uh, in a public space of Šibenik. Uh, and uh, it, it was important for me to uh, write down uh, those stories because they are deeply fascinated and uh, they would probably have been lost forever if I hadn't written them down. So it is kind of important for me to uh, give something back uh, to community, for example, in that way. And I, 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 it is also important to me that uh, not only the uh, art professionals can perceive my works, but also that someone who is not uh, familiar with the uh, contemporary art scene, uh, but also someone who is uh, not familiar uh, with creation context uh, could probably at least uh, perceive something from my work. So I'm a uh, uh, like visuals are really important, uh, visual aspect of uh, work is uh, really important to me. And uh, I, 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 I want to, uh, I want, I, 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 sorry, I forgot the word. Uh, it's like important for me uh, that someone uh, uh, can perceive uh, visually my work and then if he's interested or, or she interested that it, they can research more about the context. Yeah, which I do encourage everyone um, to read more about um, the works, to see more of the works by Lana, Lori, and Sommer. They are available online and it's truly fascinating images. Uh, um, Lori, um, I'll let you respond to the question. We also have Olga, um, who kind of joined us here on video. So if you would like to comment afterwards, please do. Mm -hmm. Lori. I will go back to, to this feminist protest statement, the personalist collective. So I try to see the collective in the personal, the international in the national somehow. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are more connected that, that maybe we think or the politics wants to make us think that we are. Um, I, I see artists uh, as, as a tool to highlight certain certain realities, to highlight the, the things that are left in, in shadow somehow. And actually seeing us all the summer um, pictures uh, when he was doing the research on the on the on the railway, I had to think about um, the high line, this photography is from Joel Stenfeld. So we go to New York somehow. <laughs> We come to New York with these photographies, and it's very interesting how um, how much visibility the High Line and this uh, uh, this old railway uh, took after Joel uh, pictures. So yeah, I think art should somehow uh, make light, put light on things, and spotlight. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. and spotlight. Yeah, probably the right the right <laughs> term, and. Yeah, that's, that's how I see it. Great. Thank you all for your very insightful answers. And um, yeah, I think you answered my question really well. And I'd like to say a few words about myself so you understand where your audience come from. I live in Toronto and I work as a researcher here at the University of Toronto. And I have personal connections to Lilia and she is uh, my um, uh, introducer to contemporary art. And that was a real luxury today to meet you all and um yeah thank you <laughs> thank you so much for being with us it's it's really a, a treat to have you um today um we have another great question from daria for the bylaw um um th who thanks L L lana laurie and summer for the dive into topics and sharing your unique perspectives. Uh, Daria asks, what was the feedback you received from the local communities when or if they saw your projects when they were exhibited? Uh, 
um, I can go first, maybe because I kind of mentioned it before. Um, actually, was kind of surprised. So I was also surprised that not a lot of people knew about this uh, um, this post-industrial landscape and this surreal uh, containers hanging. Um, but in the same time, I wanted to sort to talk. I went back and I was talking with people to tell that the stones are real and they are there because it was a bit like a urban legend until you, a bit of a San Tomaso <laughs> uh, proof that you have to prove things and, and seeing them from, with, with this strong perspective, uh, even though they were telling that the stones are still there, seeing them from above gave me a proof. And it was interesting to, 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 to talk with them after my project was realized. But I was also a bit surprised by the fact that not many people knew about it. Um, well, uh, I wanted to say that uh, uh, it differs from uh, project to project, so it differs from the topic I'm uh, dealing with in some specific project. Uh, for example, a uh, uh, pro project I uh, presented Black, uh, called Black Hill. Uh, most, of the, most of the people uh, who saw that project were not familiar with that, uh, with that, uh, with that uh, specific uh, situation, uh, so it was kind of a uh, important for me to present some that information to them. Uh, but uh, for example, when I deal with uh, the uh, topic of illegal construction and its uh, specific aesthetics, uh, uh, I have like a base of people uh, who uh, uh, some of them I know and some of them are like strangers from Instagram who, uh, who are interested in my work. And uh, for example, they uh, send me they send me pictures from uh, some houses uh, they saw in a public space uh, so that, that are related to my topic so it is uh, interesting to see that uh, they are like perceiving it more uh, they are perceiving the things i'm dealing with in my projects more in a public space after they uh, they became familiar with my work so it's kind of important for me great and summer like feedback from uh, local communities. Actually, many, uh, most of the people uh, that uh, saw my exhibition, maybe people had this idea that there are non-functional uh, railway systems, railway lines in Kosovo, but the background of it, how was it, uh, how, uh, who built it? in which con conditions people build it, it was, I think, uh, something different. I mean, something that uh, people didn't know and didn't expect. Uh, that was the uh, uh, most, uh, I mean, I had the best uh, feedbacks from that part, but I also, I had to make kind of a tour <laughs> to many people like the real space. Um, I took many people to that space. We walked around and I told the other part. Also, uh, it was a coincidence. It was not because of my work, but uh, that buildings, uh, residential buildings that were on construction in uh, this uh, railway line. Uh, um, the guy that works in municipality and that gave permission to that uh, buildings, uh, like uh, investigation was urgent uh, to him it, after a week. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, it was uh, the exhibition opening and after a week something like this happened was very strange for me. I mean, I know that it's just a coincidence, but yeah, it happened. Also, uh, um, I want to tell about this book that was uh, published by uh, Rabra Press, and it's about uh, the railway and um, at one adventure in construction. Uh, it's about uh, a youth a labor action in Yugoslavia, a Shamat Sarajevo, another line. 
Uh, also, this was published uh, a year ago, I guess. It's very interesting, and I also learned many things after the exhibition. I mean, uh, about this book. <laughs> Can't find this. Lydia, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I was telling that I'm trying to find a link to drop in the chat for everybody to the book. Okay, there is an Amazon link, the, the quickest one I could find. Um, I'll leave it here. Um, and um, I think on this note, I would like to thank everybody who joined us and uh, to those who will watch the recording later, it will be available uh, very soon um, on the uh, Residency Unlimited account in YouTube. Um, thank you again, Lori, Lana and Sommer for sharing um, with us so much about your work and we look forward to having you in New York um, next year and um, we'll um, extremely excited about the project that you will start developing during the residency um, in the US as well. Um, thank you to the team of Residency Unlimited and Trust and Mutual Understanding and uh, please tune in next month uh, for the next edition of Meets and Bounds. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.